Welcome to Dove Creek Online. My name is Zach. We are so happy that you are here. If you'd like to know more about the church, you can visit us at dovecreekbible.org. Or if you'd like to connect with us on social media, you can visit our Facebook at facebook.com slash dovecreekbible or on Instagram at dovecreekbible. Our service streams at 1030 a.m. on Sundays on either Facebook Live or YouTube. If you have any additional questions or just want to know more, you can email us at dovecreekbiblechurch at gmail.com or give us a call at 588-8993. We hope you and yours are doing well. And with that, we'll start the service.
the splendor of a king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice let all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice and how great is our God sing with me how great is our God oh see how great how great When I first started with the Evangelical Free Churches of America as a pastor, Wally Norling was our district superintendent, and occasionally Wally would come to Bakersfield to preach at our church. And on one of those occasions, he stated in a sermon with reference to his approach to life that he would rather be gullible than cynical. And I recall that sermon because I remember thinking when he said it, not me, I would not rather be gullible than cynical. I'd rather be cynical. And why is that? Is because gullibility usually leads you into ruin, causes you great embarrassment. I mean, one of the reasons that con men are able to get away with so many of their cons is that people tend to dislike reporting a crime which was primarily successful based upon their own stupidity. Now, why do I mention this? Well, if the deepest level of faith is to believe without seeing, 
Well, to some people, believing without seeing, believing without receiving, sounds awfully gullible. I remember when the television series The People's Court first came out back in the Judge Wapner days, and almost all of the cases at that time on the People's Court seemed to be loosely based on this principle of someone believed without seeing, that they somehow trusted this other person without any verification that what they were saying was trustworthy. And the plaintiff and the defendant would be arguing back and forth before Judge Wapner, and Wapner would say something to the plaintiff like, did you get a receipt? And the the plaintiff would usually go off into this long story about, well, Your Honor, he said that he would do this, and he said he would do that. And then Wapner would say, hey, I don't care what he said. Did you get a receipt? And then they would try to go off into their long explanation again. And finally, Wapner would say, did you get a receipt? And they would say, no, Your Honor, as I just explained, I didn't get a receipt. And then he would say, okay, I'll return in a moment with my verdict. And you always knew (laughs) what that verdict was going to be. You should have got a receipt, you big dummy. You should have got some kind of signed statement. You should have had a contract. You should be some paperwork. And some people have that same attitude towards you and I when it comes to our faith. To them, it seems very gullible that you and I believe in someone we haven't seen. It's like our own version of believing without getting a receipt. Now, as we've observed So far in our study of Hebrews, many of the ancients were commended for believing something that they did not see. And the last time we were together, Abraham believed without seeing and without receiving, at least in his lifetime, most of the promises that were given to him. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. The people of real faith in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews believed without seeing. Many of them believed without ever receiving, at least this side of heaven, Think about how that contrasts with a lot of Christian teaching today that says whatever you believe you should be able to achieve or receive. Chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews contradicts that view and says, no, you could still believe without seeing and you could still believe without receiving. Well, today the author ups the ante of not receiving by referring to the stories of Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. All three of those men died without seeing or receiving their inheritance. And the emphasis in the text is on where their faith was placed when they were nearing death, because the focus of the next three verses is on the blessing of children. And they usually did that at the end of their lives. So let's take a look at Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 20. And here we read the faith of Isaac. And here's what we read. By faith, Isaac did what? Blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. Now, one of the most interesting things to me in the faith chapter is that you have all of these wonderful things that are done by faith. By faith, they condemned the world. By faith, they closed the mouths of lions. By faith, they brought down fortresses. And then you get to Isaac. (laughs) And what is the big thing that he did by faith? By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. I can only respond to the great faith demonstrated here by Isaac by saying, whoop-dee-doo. That's, I mean, that's all he did? How is that a big exercise of faith? I mean, Isaac, this is the cynical part of me, Isaac, the promised child that we had all this build up to in the Old Testament, is really not even that prominent a figure in the Old Testament. There are no daring deeds of Isaac. Uh, To me, Isaac is kind of like the Jar Jar Binks of the patriarchs. He's more of a transitional character to get you to people like Jacob and Joseph, whose lives are much more interesting than his. He gets one line here in Hebrews, and the one line is this, by faith he spoke a blessing to his sons. 
which if you know the story, doesn't even appear to be really true, at least in any admirable sense. And so I take some solace in the fact that Hebrews 11 not only mentions the faith of these ancients, never does it mention their failures. It is almost as if those failures never happened at all. If you read chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, you think that all these people did, all the live long day besides work on the railroad, was live by faith, and the truth is they didn't. I mean, take our friend Isaac here, for example. You think that when you, if you, Hebrews 11 was all you knew about Isaac, you think that from the very beginning, all that Isaac ever wanted to do was bless Jacob and Esau, and in that order, that he never wavered in his blessing, but he did. Because God said the main blessing would go to Jacob before the boys were born. Jacob and Esau were twins. And Isaac only ends up inadvertently blessing the right son because he got tricked into it. All right, let's refresh our memories of what happened. In Genesis 25, Rebekah, Isaac's wife, is pregnant with these twin boys. She seems to sense that they're experiencing sibling rivalry even in her womb. She asks the Lord why these two boys are struggling in her womb, and the Lord tells her that each boy represents a nation, and those two nations will struggle with one another, but the youngest son would prevail because he had the Lord's blessing. Now, the boys grew up. They could not be more different from one another. Esau, the oldest son, was a hairy man who became a skillful hunter. He was a man of the open country, while Jacob, the youngest son, was a hairless man who was a quiet homebody who stayed among the tents with his mother, basically. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau more than Jacob, and Rebekah loved Jacob more than Esau. Now, even though God had already said that Jacob was his choice, Esau was Isaac's choice, and so he was determined to give the primary blessing to Esau in direct contradiction to what the Lord had said. However, Jacob and Rebekah were able to trick Isaac and Esau, so he actually ended up blessing the right person. So, Let's try to get all this into perspective. Isaac willfully chooses to disobey God in order to bless Esau over Jacob. But Jacob, at his mother's prodding, manipulates and deceives his father into giving him the blessing instead. I mean, sometimes you read this Old Testament stuff and you said, is this the Bible or is this an episode of all my children? I mean, it's just incredibly dysfunctional. Isaac and Esau are attempting to circumvent the revealed will of God, and Rebekah and Jacob are attempting to fulfill the revealed will of God in the wrong way. So if you really think about it, shouldn't Hebrews 11.20, shouldn't it really read like this? By a lack of faith, Isaac intended to bless Esau over Jacob in regard to their future, but Jacob lied and manipulated him, so he ended up blessing Jacob anyway, just as God intended. That seems to me like how it should read, but that's not how it reads. Why doesn't it read that way? It doesn't read that way because Isaac's faithlessness is forgotten and only his faithfulness is remembered. What the author of Hebrews is actually referring to is this. Later in life, Isaac conceded his own desires and ambition and did what he should have done in the first place, and that is to give the blessing to Jacob in the right way for the right reason, and that's in Genesis 28. So Isaac called for Jacob and blessed him and commanded him, Do not marry a Canaanite woman. Man, I remember my parents giving me that same advice. I actually married a girl from Lamont, so I came pretty close. But anyway, I digress. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. May he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham so that you may take possession of the land 
where you now live as an alien, the Lord gave to Abraham. So Isaac's faith definitely faltered in chapter 27 of Genesis when he tried to circumvent God's will. But in Genesis 28, he does by faith what he should have done in the first place. So Genesis 27 is forgotten, and Genesis 28 is all that's remembered. And what's true for Isaac is true for you and me as well. Our failures are forever forgotten, and only the times that you and I obeyed and were faithful will be remembered. And they will be remembered for all eternity. Now let's look at verse 21. We go to the next person, Jacob. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. And that story is found in Genesis 48. And here's the blessing that Jacob gave. May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully, uh, the God who has been the shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they be called by my name and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly on earth. And so we see how Jacob sort of combined worshiping God in with his blessing of his grandsons. He made them promise to bury him in the promised land. So we have Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. Now we have uh, Jacob blessing the sons of Joseph. And now we get to Joseph in verse 22 of Hebrews 11. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, remember all of this is during the time when they're ending their lives or drawing near to the end of their lives and they're blessing their children. When his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. And this is in Genesis 50 where the death of Joseph is recorded. It says Joseph stayed in Egypt along with his father's family. He lived 110 years, and he saw the third generation of Ephraim's children, also the children of Mekir, son of Manasseh, were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So here we see Joseph, like his father, made his brothers promise that they would take his bones with him into the promised land and bury his bones there. So in a way, Jacob and Joseph both determined at the time of their deaths if they were not going to inherit the land during the course of their lifetimes, then at the very least, the land was going to inherit their bones at the time of their deaths. Now, what are the applications to these verses here in this section of Hebrews? And what this section is really about, I think, is the importance of passing on the baton of faith. What makes the death of all three men significant is they all died without seeing the fulfillment of God's promises, and they did not know exactly when those promises would be fulfilled. Nevertheless, they continued to believe in those promises, and, and this is the important part, they instilled in their children, and their children's children, and their children's children's children that very same belief in these promises. And in doing so, they passed on their faith in the promises of God to their children. Now you think about that for a moment. Over the course of hundreds of years, each generation died and passed on that baton of faith to the next generation, and then that generation died and passed on the baton of faith to the generation after them until finally you've gone about 500 years. 500 years. And the only thing for most of those generations to pass on is not 
the promise fulfilled, but the promise of the promise being fulfilled. And Abraham passed that on to Isaac, and Isaac passed it on to Jacob, and Jacob to Joseph, and Joseph to Manasseh and Ephraim, until you reach a day about 500 years later in Exodus 13 when they remember the promise that was made to Joseph some 500 years earlier. So let me ask you, are you doing anything in your life right now that you think anybody is going to remember 500 years from now? Each man's blessing to their children reminded those children of the promise God made and how they were certain that the promise would one day be fulfilled. And that simple act of faith extended in the past to grab that baton of faith from the generation that had gone ahead of them, and then they reached forward and passed that baton on to the generation in front of them. They, by faith, believed and blessed well beyond their own lifetimes into the lifetimes of future generations until finally you reach that generation that would actually receive the promised blessing. When some of these men and women faltered in their faith, which they did, of course, it was for the same reason that you and I falter in our faith. Fear. Fear would sometimes disconnect their faith from God. And when they became disconnected, they would start to lean on their own understanding and they would try to work under their own power. They would rely on their own strength and their own ingenuity to solve whatever their problems were at that particular time. When my sons, Jacob and Zachary, were little boys, they slept in the same room in bunk beds. And my oldest son, Jacob, slept on the top bunk, and Zachary slept on the lower bunk. And one night after Jacob climbed up into his bed, into the top bunk, he suddenly remembered that he had forgotten to do something. So he climbed down the bunk ladder and left the room to go do whatever it is he had to go do. And little Zachary then took that opportunity to climb up that bunk ladder and to slide under the covers in Jacob's bed. And there he silently waited for his prey to return. So when Jacob returned and he climbed up the ladder into his bed, there lurking in the darkness, unbeknownst to him, was a Zachary Scott ready to jump out and grab him. And the next sound we heard was Jacob screaming and Zachary laughing hysterically. Well, sometimes we feel like while we're waiting for God's plan to unfold, that he brings us into these periods of darkness. And when we go through a period of darkness, we start to imagine that there might be some Zachary Scott in that darkness hidden, waiting to jump out and get us. You know, when I was a kid, just like just about every kid I know, I was afraid of the dark. And here's what I learned about darkness. When it's dark, I never imagined that there were good things waiting for me in that darkness, only bad things. I never entered a creepy, dark room and thought to myself, I wonder if there's toys and puppies hidden somewhere in the darkness in here. No, I always imagined there were monsters and horrible things like that awaiting me in the darkness. Now, as an adult, I probably haven't changed all that much. Just my monsters have changed. And so when things go dark for me today, as an adult, my first reaction is usually fear, not faith. My imagination takes over, and fear begins to knock on the door of my heart. 
I want to read to you an excerpt from a letter written by a woman who wrote to her daughters as she was dying of cancer. And here's what she wrote. Quote, my daughters, fear has knocked on my door. Sometimes in the past five days, I decided to let fear in, to sit with me for a while. It has not been good, and I thought of silly things like, I can't wear that new spring suit I just bought on sale, or that lovely wool skirt that I waited six months for. Other times, I thought of how much I wanted to see both of you, my daughters, graduate from high school, go off to Bible college. I wanted to see you fall in love with fine Christian young men. I wanted to watch as your daddy walked you down the aisle on your wedding day. I wanted to see you settle down and have children, my grandchildren. But these thoughts, dear children of mine, are human thoughts. And to dwell on them too long is unhealthy. I know that one of the strongest desires God has given us is the desire to live. But I trust him in this too, for my vision is so limited. These human desires are the purest on earth, but I, I suspect that if I had even the tiniest glimpse of heaven, I wouldn't really want to stay here. However, because I'm human, I do. So I have decided to put up a no trespassing sign at the entrance of the path of human desire. I have decided not to let my thoughts wander down that path anymore. When fear knocks, it is my determined choice to let faith answer the door. Faith that is settled on the sure promises of God. End of quote. That's all Jacob had to pass on. That's all Isaac had to pass on. That's all Joseph had to pass on. It was faith that was settled on the sure promises of God. And they passed on that faith to their children and their children's children and their children's children's children. And during times of confusion, when they heard fear knocking on the door of their heart, they had to decide Who was going to answer the knock on the door? How do you respond when uncertainty knocks on the door of your heart? When fear knocks, you say, well, anxiety, that must be for you, or worry, I think someone's at the door for you. You know, you and I, we don't get to decide what fears are going to knock on the doors of our heart. We only get to decide how that door is going to be answered with our own fear or with faith. There's an old saying that goes, fear knocked on the door, and faith answered, and no one was there. Now, Abraham's faith wasn't in Isaac, 
And Isaac's faith wasn't in Jacob, and Jacob's faith wasn't in Joseph. Their faith was in God. The fulfillment of the promises rested in His faithfulness, not in their own faithfulness. And I find great comfort and hope in that realization. It's good for me to know that God is going to continue to work even when I'm doing my very best to make a mess of things. Paul wrote to a young pastor named Timothy, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Why? For he cannot disown himself. Was Abraham faithless? Yes, he was. And when he was faithless, God remained faithful because he cannot disown himself. Was Isaac faithless? Isaac was faithless, but God remained faithful. Why? Because he cannot disown himself. When Jacob was faithless, God remained faithful, for he cannot disown himself. And so that must mean when you and I are faithless, he also remains faithful. For he cannot disown himself. Now, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, they did not know what the future held, but at least they knew who held it. And for them, that knowledge was enough. Is it enough for you? Fear of the unknown can only be uprooted by faith in the known. Paul wrote to Timothy, So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose in grace. And this grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. And that is why I am suffering as I am. Yet, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded, I am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted to him until that day. We talked at the beginning of this sermon about whether it's gullible to believe without seeing and receiving. I think it all depends on what you're really looking for, what you really want to accomplish, and what you truly view to be your greatest reward. Ronald Reagan once said, freedom is never more than a generation away from extinction. I think that's probably true of faith. It is never more than a generation away from extinction. In blessing their children, it may not have seemed that these men of faith did all that much, but in truth, they understood that 
their main responsibility was to create a legacy of faith to pass on to the next generation. And so they understood that the best use of their time was to invest it in those things that would outlast their own lives. And in doing so, they became great examples of faith in the memories of their families for generations to come. What kind of an example of faith are you? To your friends and family, what manner of legacy are you leaving your family? Are you investing your time in anything right now that's going to outlive you and survive for generations to come. You know, right now at this very moment, people are watching the way you and I are responding to this present crisis. Our children are watching. Our grandchildren are watching. Our friends are watching. Our students are watching. Our employees are watching. Our fellow workers are watching. Our neighbors are watching. And as they watch, they are assessing whether your faith is really a factor in your response. And they know from what you say and what you do who really answered the door when fear knocked. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we consider now the faith of Isaac and Jacob and Joseph in the blessing of their children, we, first of all, are grateful that we notice that only their times of faithfulness are recorded, and their times of failure are forever forgotten. We also know that their legacy lasted not just a short time after they passed away, but for hundreds of years after they passed away. That Their great-great-great-grandchildren were still speaking of these promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. On upwards towards 500 years. 500 years of instilling in their families. belief in the certain promises of God. And most of those generations continued to believe without seeing and to be certain without receiving till the day came when the generation had arrived that would receive the promises that were made some 500 years earlier. And they remembered to take the bones of Joseph because of a promise they had made to him some 500 years before.
Lord, may we be the kind of Christians who model a kind of faith that if other people don't believe in, at least they believe that we believe. That we give credibility to our testimony. By grasping that baton of faith in the generation behind us and passing it on to the generation in front of us. It is so important in these difficult days in which we live that people believe in something beyond this world. That they have hope in a promise that is certain and true. Lord, if you, by your grace, will enable us to do all these things, we will be quick to give you the praise in the name of our dear Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Stop the Lord.